So um, let's restart uh, the final session of um, the workshop with uh, Fabio Macchiaro. Very good. That's the most loud we can get. Now careful. Very good. I see that you took Peter's advice very seriously. <laughs> you start taking decisions theory by moving. <laughs> you are right. You are right. And uh, imagine how it would have been difficult for Steve Rogers to take the decision if Peggy was sitting there and telling him, no, 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 but do this. We can't do that. It, I mean, time pressure would have gotten crazy at that point, right? So <coughs> this is basically the idea of the paper. Um, <laughs> so um, after we had that idea, we had to try and, uh, and find uh, the ceremonial uh, dresses for it. And so we went to the literature. And in the literature, we find a prequel of Capitan America, which is Charles Plot. And uh, he basically writes this. Uh, yeah, that decisions are optimal when decision makers have sufficient time and practice to understand the choice environment and how their basic needs are satisfied by the different alternatives. Okay? For example, the time to read carefully a menu, the time to scan carefully the room you enter late to the conference. If you could just stay here and sit and decide where to sit, it would be better in terms of opti optimization, but then there are time constraints, right? So, and uh, then, Basically, the discovered preference hypothesis is that even if agents add well-defined preferences, and Chris was putting some doubts on that, but even, let's say, even when they have, under time pressure, randomness kicks in. And there is a very nice paper by Agranov, Tergiman, and Kaplan where a beauty contest is played, and depending on the time, the agents have to bid, the bid goes down and down and down and down. It's impressive. That, I mean, the pictures in those papers are very nice from, from this perspective. But then uh, Charles Plot to say, a clearly, a clearly articulated theory from, for, from which precise quantitative propositions can be deduced, well, this paper is a philosophy rather than a clearly articulated theory. This paper is a clearly articulated theory about that. OK, so this is what uh, we will try to do. Of course, there is a difference between philosophies and theories. Philosophies are very broad, while theories tend to be a bit narrower, but uh, we hope not too much. So specifically, I will not talk about the old paper, but just about uh, one section of the paper. And uh, the section of the paper is basically basically will lead us here. So there is a decision maker, Steve Rogers, on the spaceship. And you have time T to decide what to do. You have a family, he has a set capital A of alternatives. That is to say, you have a decision problem. And you have to choose an alternative. And I will write P sub T of A given big A, the probability that Steve Rogers will choose little a from big A, OK? And what we will study are the conditions on these observables, the PTs, that tell you that the PTs can be represented in this way. Oh, you recognize it, right? This is a multinomial logic. This is a multinomial logic where there is a parameter lambda, the precision, that depends on time. 
And then there is a utility which do not depend on time. OK? In the multinomial logic, lambda is just a parameter. There is no time there. Uh, let's see what happens. If no time is available, that is to say, that is to say, if t goes to 0, this decision maker will just pick one alternative randomly. OK, imagine again, you have a menu, zero time to choose, you just pick one. While as t goes to infinity, what happens is that uh, utility differences matter more and more and more. So if, the if, the decision ma if this decision maker, who has a preference, have time and, and or practice, what will happen, it will basically converge to a utility maximizer. Notice, I mean, this is hieroglyphics, but this is very simple. This is what this says that the probability of choosing A out of A is zero if A does not maximize the utility, while if the alternative maximizes, all the maximizers are chosen with the same probability. OK? I mean, these two things are just limit consequences of that representation. Again, what do we do in the paper? In the paper, we start from uh, choice frequencies that for us are just a way of organizing choice data. And we say, if choice frequencies satisfy some properties, then that will be the way they look. In other words, then it's a good idea to represent them, to study them by a multinomial logic. OK. So uh, what is old in this paper? What is very old is that is uh, the basic part of the formula. Fix a time t. As now t is the time of the experiment, right? It's the time frame of the experiment. If t is the time frame of the experiment, it's very easy to find the v that depends on, it's not very easy, it's very smart, is what Luce did. Find the v that depends on t such that this is the probability of choosing a out of a. But what we care about is not the static shot of an experiment, but rather the decision process. OK, so since we care about the decision process, the difficult part of the task is finding conditions that give us a time-independent utility, which is that one, the one that, will be maxim, that would be maximized if, the, there were no if there was no time pressure, and a time-dependent, here you read homomorph homeomorphism parameter, such that VDT has this form. OK, so the idea here is that every screenshot is very easy to take it, right? The, the difficult part in the exercise will be linking the subsequent choice, the, the time, the, 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 it will be describing the evolution of the VT that tell you that uh, the VTs have this form. Of course, if I put a U here, the exercise is dead. Right? If you were, t, it were time dependent, there would be no point. But especially if little u were time dependent, we wouldn't be following this uh, discovered preference hypothesis. U is the preference that will be discovered, that would be discovered if the decision maker had infinite time to compute or to reason or to practice his choice. Uh, well, uh, what, say it again. Well, I, I, I suppose I was thinking that um, I, I, see what, I see why you want the utility not to be time dependent mm -hmm. as an implementation of a discovered preference. But you could imagine from a sort of testing point of view, you could imagine this as a special case. Absolutely. Of a model. Of a model. Yes, yeah. of course. You are assuming a model, a for example, a multinomial logic model to describe your data. And our axiom will tell you, you look at the data. And the, our axiom will tell you, if the data don't satisfy this axiom, uh, uh, trying to fit a multinomial logic with this data is a very bad idea. OK? Because there will be no parameter of the logit that will allow you to fit your data, because your data are not logit. OK. 
So old and new. So uh, I think that it's very easy to see, for, even for decision theorists, uh, why this time dependent, this time independent function is a utility. Okay, why do we see that? Because uh, of course, if this is the time, uh, if this is the formula, and this uh, thing is time independent, the probability of choosing u versus x, the odds of u versus x will increase uh, as the utility increases, right? So the interpretation of u as utility, I think, is rather uncontroversial. Why do we want to call lambda accuracy? There is, please. I do understand that a function will be, in, uh, u will be an orderly transformation, strictly increasing of utility. But why that would be exactly the right kind an of or, No, no, no. An ordinal, by utility, I mean an ordinal increasing transformation of utility. Absolutely. And uh, uh, as for lambda, uh, let's see what, what happens as lambda increases. OK, now we have two alternatives, b and a. Here I'm plotting the utility of b. I'm keeping the utility of b fixed, and I'm moving the utility of a. What happens is that as lambda goes up, the, and these curves are the psychometric functions, meaning are the function that plot the probability of choosing a over b. As you see, as lambda goes up, the probability of choosing the alternative with higher utility goes up. So in, in discrimination theory, in psychophysics, this is the lambda is called the slope of the psychometric function and tell you how precise is your ability to distinguish the stimuli. And the stimuli here being A and B. So first thing, we are happy to call lambda an accuracy parameter because it captures sensibility sensitivity, actually, to utility difference. There is a deeper reason. And the deeper reason is that just playing with this lemma, you can prove that for every fixed t, the probability that we find is what? Is the probability of u of a plus an error term is greater than the probability of all the other alternatives plus an error term. And as time goes by, the, error, the variance of the error term, which is 1 over lambda squared times pi, uh, pi squared uh, divided 6, vanishes. OK, so there are two good reasons. There are two good reasons to interpret this lambda as an accuracy or sensibility <coughs> parameter. OK, and uh, if you want, the, the difficult part is exactly st starting from the VTs, obtaining the lambda and the u. So this is the task that we will. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering how I interpret time here. There are, give, give me one slide okay. and you will, I will answer this question. But uh, I, 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 st I start with the, OK, a spoiler. Don't Two ways. One way is reflection. So the time that you have to ponder on your problem. And the other is uh, practice, meaning the number of times you have been facing this problem. Assume, for example, that you are a rabbit. And uh, you meet a wolf. And you have three alternatives. Freeze, and hope he doesn't see you, right? Or run, or fight. OK, this is a, there is a fighter rabbit in, in this story. And uh, assume that the first time it's the first time you meet a wolf. You don't know what a wolf is. You randomize. OK, so t now is equal to 1. The second time, you have the feedback of the first time. For example, a bite mark on your back. And then, uh, and then you will put more weight on run or freeze. And as time goes by, you get uh, closer and closer to the fitness of uh, the alternative. So in this evolutionary perspective, u is fitness. And as you practice, if you survive, you learn the fitness. But, it, but it's definitely not then in some sense real time, is it? It's no, 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 it's not real. More subtle than. Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. In, uh, in so the Kaplan Agranov, Agranov experiment, is really time. Yeah. And lambda is really a decreasing function of time. 
And but in the time there is a proxy in some sense for how hard it is for you to make a good decision right now. Uh, not really time. How hard it is is the lambda. Because if you have a very high lambda, it's not difficult for you to make the decision. Assume that lambda t jumps immediately to infinity. Bam. So now it can be genuine time, while in many situations, for example, in quantum response equilibria, in the in the results of ox that are then, uh, well, in those results, time is really repetition. Is how many times you are playing matching pennies. And so to speak, experience. Experience, exactly. It all depends on the, on the pattern of the lambda, right? So if lambda t is increasing, then you can interpret it as experience. But if it's decreasing, then you have to interpret it as uh, fatigue, for yes, example. Yes. Or this uh, time pressure, which was in the mood in the morning. Do you mean uh, no, the time pressure I interpret it as a very short t. If yes. you have a little. Yes, but isn't it the same then? Yes. So the, then, but in that case, the lambda t should be decreasing in order to, to observation to hold. Uh, other, otherwise, if one. No, on the, the contrary. Control. Assume that you are, you, are, you are flying your jet plane, your jet. You have one second, very high imprecision. Two seconds, very higher precision. Three seconds, even higher precision. Right? The more time you have to choose, the better will be your choice. So if Captain America, rather than being flying at Mach 3, would be flying at Mach 1, he had tries, <laughs> right? OK. Because, I mean, it, is, it, it goes with the inverse of the mistake. Very good. So, um, so uh, let's go back to the timeless model that is lurking behind this. So uh, this, look at this. This is just a parametric model. Lambda here is a parameter. What we will study in this paper is how t affects the right parameter to model your decision problem. This model has many names in different strands of decision making. For example, in uh, psychophysics, m is called a logistic parametric family. Lambda is called the slope of the psychometric function. In fact, lambda is four times the tangent at zero at the curves that I've been showing you. And since Cattell at the beginning of the 1900s, there is this observation that the more the time the agents have to discriminate to, to use of gray, the better the discrimination of the agent becomes. So in that case, Utility is just the ability to recognize the stimuli. Uh, in discrete choice analysis, uh, and especially in panel experiment where the decision makers face uh, several questions. This is the multinomial logic model, as I said, and lambda measures the standard deviation of the unexplained component of uh, this random utility. And what they observe, uh, and this goes back to his observation, is that lambda changes with time. For example, fatigue is described by a lambda that, uh, a lambda that decreases. So with fatigue, lambda decreases, and uh, the, the, the decision gets more and more fuzzy, while with learning, lambda increases. In the, here I will be talking about increasing lambda. In the paper, we have all the possible uh, lambda dynamics. But here I'm just talking about uh, the learning story, which is the one close to time pressure. The more time you have to think, the better decision you will take. Again, time is not chosen strategically. Time is just uh, a way of organizing the data. Uh, and in quantum response equilibrium, well, this is the model that makes quantum response equilibrium. And <laughs> lambda represents, uh, according to Gori, Palfrey, and co-authors, it represents uh, the degree of sophistication of uh, the agents playing the game. And in fact, as lambda goes to infinity, the, si the players in the game play a Nash equilibrium while uh, as lambda goes to zero, the players just pick randomly. OK. Uh, well, again, in all three fields, as time goes by, or as repetition goes by, many observations point to the fact that lambda increases. 
questions so far? Okay. So, okay, so we can go to the setup. The setup is a very standard setup. There is a set capital X of all the alternatives available. And a decision problem is just a subset of capital X. In the present stage, we consider finite subsets. So we are in the spirit of discrete choice analysis. So capital script A is the class of all non-empty finite subsets of X. And we will denote by delta of A the set of all the probabilities that have support into A. Meaning that if you have to choose from menu A, you cannot choose something that is served in the other restaurant. Okay? Uh, so this is uh, the central and only definition in the paper, uh, in, uh, in the presentation. A random choice process is what? Is a collection of uh, random choice rules. That is to say of functions that uh, to every decision problem A associate a probability distribution among the alternatives. So again, I think that you are fed up with this. What is PT? little a of big A is the probability that alternative A is chosen from set capital A if T is the amount of time that the decision maker is given to make up his mind. Is this definition clear? Okay, so this is the, the central character of this little tail. Another way of seeing T is the number of time the rabbit have been meeting the wolf. Okay? And uh, uh, just uh, two pieces of notation that are standard. I will write PTAB, the probability of choosing A over B. OK? And uh, sometimes it's useful to think in terms of probabilities. Sometimes it's useful to think in terms of odds, right? What are the odds of choosing A over B? That is to say, the ratio between the two probabilities. OK? OK, what has, so again, you remember what, where we want, where we want, girl, something very bad is happening. OK. So now we will put assumption on PT that will lead us to the soft max model I was talking about. OK. Of course, there are two assumptions that you think you can think for free, right? In every stage, the decision maker will have to behave a la loose, right? So in every finite time, you must have full support. In the paper, we have the non-full support version. But for now, let's take the full support. Yes. Let's take the full support and conditional probability. This tells you that the probability of choosing a from A is the probability of the two-stage process of first focusing on B and then choosing A from B. These are the assumptions of loose, and they give us this. OK, what, what is, the, so what is the, the proportion of, of the entire path that we covered? We covered this part of the representation. What do we still have to cover is this part of the representation. And getting to that was fun. <laughs> so some assumptions are very simple. Continuity. Continuity is continuity. Meaning that uh, as S goes to T, PS goes to P, T. OK? Of course, uh, the moment in which you think of decision makers that are just uh, that have breakthrough, this continuity is violated. OK? And then, uh, actually, uh, CAD lag, so continuity, continuity from uh, the right would be enough, but continuity is easier to, to write. Uh, time consistency. Time consistency, this is very important, because this axiom tells you exactly that uh, the decision maker is optimizing. So he is trying to get somewhere. The fact is that his, his ability to discern is getting better and better and better and better. OK, so this tells you that if the probability of choosing A is greater than the probability of choosing B, 
at time t, then this also happens at time t plus 1. OK? If, if this weren't the case, there would be, if you want, probabilistic preference reversals, right? That are obviously inconsistent with any random utility model. And ours is there, please. Of course, no, 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 but look, what can happen in truth is that one time you choose A, one time you choose B, one time you choose A, one time you choose B, but the probability, this is monotonicity in probability. This is not monoton, it's not that uh, if you once choose A over B, then you go on forever choosing A over B. No, that would be too much in, in all senses. No, 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 what I'm saying is that, that the probability of choosing uh, if you choose, if I see you choosing A over B many times, as time goes by, this probability, if I, if I see you choosing A more often than B, as time goes by, you will choose A more and more and more and more and more often. Be, think of a reinforcement mechanism, right? But you require it to be strictly monotone. Monot I am requiring strictly monotone. It sounds very strong. Right? I have both in the paper. Yeah. Okay. But no, 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 no this, this is very, I, I, he is super right. And in fact, this is what Massimo has been bugging me. But unfortunately, if you don't ask strictly monotone, the result is simply false. So that, the form that you have just seen is strictly monotone, and you don't get it. And there are forms that are weakly monotone that are not logit. So, but in the paper, we deal with, we characterize them with all the theorems, uh, functional forms, and everything. But I think that this is so beautiful that uh, I will pay this price. OK. No, but you're perfectly right. This is the strongest axiom, actually. Uh, asymptotic uniformity. What does this mean? It means, assume that now you go in the limit. If when you have no time constraint, you can, I see you choosing either A or B with positive probability, then you choose them with the same probability. Of course, this assumption has some bite, but it tells you, look, if at the end of the time you are still uncertain, it means that you like them the same. Because all that you could learn from experience or from introspection has been learned. So if now you still have doubt, it means that your alternatives are must be equal. I'm not defending these axioms normatively. I'm just saying uh, you must observe these if you want to get there. And there is a sense, and they make some sense. The sense is, just one second, at the beginning of the time, all alternatives will be chosen with the same probability. Why? Because you know nothing. At the end of the time, all the alternatives that can be chosen, that is to say those that uh, are chosen with positive probability will be chosen with the same probability. Why? For the opposite reason now, because now you learned all there was to learn. Please. Uh, it, it seems like you always seem to have infinity like at n time. And then I, I wonder why do you keep uh, infinity at a time increasing or la uh, or, or rather than decreasing? So it decreases to zero, then all this infinity in your condition becomes zero. zero right? We have both in the paper. We have all in the, no, I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> I mean, you should choose something, right? I want to talk about one thing, because I could talk about the entire paper, but then we would be late for dinner. <laughs> uh, yes, they are equivalent. If you, those two cases are really equivalent. And I will focus on learning rather than fatigue, OK? If, just one second, if I were a, mach a guy from machine learning, I would think of temperature, which is the inverse of time. And I would think that uh, as temperature goes up, my computer gets crazy and uh, chooses randomly. So if I were talking to machine learner or to people in physics, where as temperature goes up, particles get crazy, I would be talking about the other case. Other questions? Mm. Oh, sorry, sorry. So you allow for two interpretations of t. Yes. So I think this makes more sense when t means the number of times you have faced the same problem. But mm -hmm. if you say it's just you have, you make this decision and you have an infinite amount of time, mm -hmm. then I'm not sure if <coughs> this. I'm not sure either. But if, 
uh, after, after infinite, so assume now that you have two coffee dates. So you can go for coffee with two possible colleagues, okay, say Adi and Chris, okay? And you have a lot of time, so coffee will get cold. But uh, in the end, you really cannot make up your mind. So you have, you have no time constraint, but still you can't decide. Well, I would toss a coin. Even out of interest to solve the, the inability to introspectively discern between the two coffees. But again, I'm, not, I'm just trying to read what they say, and I have no stake on them. Please. Okay. And you receive random noise, each period cor positive correlated with an unknown value. Okay. So then you characterize the stable distribution. See? Uh, can you be adapted? Uh, 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 think of where t goes to infinity, okay. uh, diffusion goes to zero. No, drift goes to zero, and that's it. Uh, and boundedness. Okay, this axiom again, this, this is another moving part. You, we can deal without, uh, uh, time, without uh, strong time consistency and without boundedness. I will start with boundedness, I will weaken boundedness, and I will leave the without boundedness for those willing to read the paper. Okay, and what does boundedness say? It tells you that uh, the odds do not uh, explode. Notice that for every finite time, this quantity is finite, right? Because of, because of full support, this quantity is finite, this quantity is finite, this quantity is finite. So the thing in between the moduli is always finite. This condition is a condition that tells you that quantity do not explode. And it is related to the older theorem Peter was talking about many hours ago now, okay? So this condition tells you that uh, uh, the older theorem is much more powerful than Peter thinks, okay? And then I, I, I will not enter this debate. Very good. Now, time for the first theorem. The first theorem say, assume that x is countable. We can do without it. In the paper, it's without it. But countability saves us an axiom, OK? A random choice process satisfies full support. You remember what it means. Conditional probability, these are the two assumptions of loose. Continuity is continuity. Time consistency is strong. We discussed it quite a bit. Asymptotic uniformity means that after practice and reflection, you cannot make up your mind, you just toss a fair coin. And boundedness, if and only if there exists a function u from x to r, and a linear homomorphism, in this case is just a constant, but you will see why I wrote it this way, okay? Such that you have exactly the form that I promised you. Remember, a linear homomorphism is a very uh, Byzantine way to say lambda times t. Okay, but in a second, linearity will be lost. Okay, so now it is a constant times t. Okay, and everything is as unique as it can get. That is to say, cardinally unique. Uh, why? Uh, what is that drives linearity of lambda? Linearity of lambda is driven by older theorem. And now we have to weaken older theorem to get a nonlinear one. And so we have to weaken boundedness and get to weak boundedness. Weak boundedness means that irrespectively of how subjective time is measured, that there is one way, the subjective way of measuring time, such that you have boundedness. Okay, if you, you can think of W as the subjective speed of time for the individual. Okay, for example, as take me and my son, I think that time passes much faster for him than for me. It depends. In some things, it passes much slower for him than for me, but uh, it definitely passes differently for him, or for me that I'm talking and for you that are 
sitting. Okay, so this is of course a weakening because when as w you take the identity, you get the two boundedness. When you look at this weak form of boundedness, you have the result that I promised. Okay, should I read it? See. So, uh, random choice process, full support, conditional probability, continuity, time consistency, asymptotic uniformity, and weak boundedness. When boundedness is weak, this is what happens. So we get exactly to the formula that I proposed. So this formula tells you that to capture, that uh, to capture, for example, time pressure or preference learning, you can use a logit model where the precision depends on the time. If you want to talk about learning, precision increases with time. If we want to talk about fatigue, precision decreases with time. If you, think, if you want to think of the optimal moment to choose, and then you get bored and whatever, you will have uh, something looking like that. Okay, once you do one, all the rest is just uh, all the rest is just being able to work with it. Yes. Uh, any questions at that point, at this point? Very good. So I'm basically done. So what do you, do you find in the paper? You find comparative statics and uh, the way in which uh, comparative statics mean what happens if um, uh, me and Natalie have different processor speeds, OK? Basically, if she has an higher processor speed than mine, her choices will do stochastically dominate mine. This is uh, uh, comparative statics in a nutshell. Lambda's computer speed is very nice because assume that I am a car thief, okay, and then I have all my minions, and all of my minions get here with one of with their stolen cars, but I hear poli the police. Uh, the, the police is coming. If I had time to estimate exactly the value of all the cars, I would take the one that I can sell at higher price, right? So lambda is really computational ability. The higher is my lambda, the faster and the better I can compute the value of the car, and the less mistakes I will do. Uh, uncountable x is very simple. You can guess the axiom. We give the version with no boundedness at all, but in which there still is preference learning, meaning a version where uh, there is no boundedness, so now vt will depend on t, but will depend on t in a such a way that uh, the ordinal transformation of utility that leads the dance is maintained. And this will come from weak time consistency. Okay? And then uh, you find uh, an economic application to consumer theory, law of demands still holds on average, and you find the related literature. And finally, what we are doing here, we are thinking of what happens with what did we learn about quantal response equilibria and uh, what happened in quantal response equilibria when we have a timed protocol, meaning what happens to the Nash equilibrium when the time to choose changes. Okay, mm, basta. You, already, you have already seen. Uh, the movie, so I think uh, that's it. No, it's super easy to test the model. Be and actually, actually, I mean, this was, uh, I, I was as worried as you are. Until Giorgio Romagnoli gave me this paper. This paper gives a fantastic protocol to, to, to look exactly at the P of T. Okay, and the idea is the following. Uh, assume I give you uh, a game or a decision problem, and you can adjust your choice as time goes by. Okay. And then, so now you have, uh, I don't know, a quarter of an hour. And uh, as time goes by, whenever you want, you change uh, your strategy. And then one time will be picked, uh, and you will be paid according to what you chose in that uh, instant. 
Okay, so basically the beauty of that is that we, you will observe a continuum of t's, right? And of course you will not observe a beautifully continuous differentiable thing, I bet. But I mean, this is true for, phys for physics. In physics, you never measure uh, speed differences in, con in continuum. You measure them in discrete, and then you have a continuum theory. At each point in time, let's suppose you've got five elements in your choice set. Yes. You've got to estimate five probabilities of four, let's At each point in time, how many observations do you need to estimate the probability? Uh, no, well, it's a frequency, so it's very simple. It's just frequency. So, in well, just for for each subject, right? For each subject, you get uh, uh, one frequency, right? For every instant in your 15 minutes, right? Now, if you want, uh, how do you compute this frequency? You you see one choice every five minutes, right? And what they do is basically having them playing many times for 15 minutes and compute this frequency. I mean, they do that, and I like I mean, it seems reasonable to me. If it has been done, it is doable. <laughs> but I, but I, I, missed, I haven't understood what, what would be the prediction of, of your model that you would be testing in that setup? Uh, what, uh, two thi first, what happens? from what I get uh, in the discrete uh, choice analysis literature is that people say, I have, a, a, I have choice frequencies, right? And uh, I take uh, a log the, log the multinomial logit model, and I, f I look for the utility and uh, the error term. That is for the little u and for the lambda that fits my data, right? This is what, what happened. Yeah. And uh, if you have panel data, you can see how lambda evolves with time, OK? And the question is, can you use this model to do your, I mean, does fitting this model make any sense? Uh -huh. And the answer is, it may, I, I like that model. I, I find it beautiful. And I tell you when it makes sense. It makes sense if and only if you don't see violations of these axioms. The same goes for loose. What does the loose model tell you? The loose model tells you, can you use a, a uh, not a panel, the, con the opposite of panel, cross-section. Can I use cross-section to estimate utilities? And loose paper tells, loose, loose books tell you, you can, provided the frequencies have full support and conditional probability. What I tell you is, can you do the same exercise with panel data? And the answer is yes, if the data fit into these axioms. This is, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody cares. No, but I what, understand. I understand. What, uh, what, uh, this is the way in which you can use it. The way, uh, one second. The, the way in which I see it is very different. Uh, I care just relatively to use it. What I care about is trying to see whether I can formulate a theory of an hypothesis. The hypothesis is the discovered preference hypothesis. It's an hypothesis that introspectively and experimentally seems sensible. And what we get here is, I think, a simple but still very used theory, foundation for this hypothesis. Absolutely. So then, then you can actually basically you work along with consumers, and then lambda t is a heterogeneity parameter, right? So kind of how noisy. That's is. very true. See, there is a paper by people in Ireland doing exactly this for uh, species uh, for species preservation. Yes, very good comment. Yeah, Grazie. The, 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 well, my question is that because of the discrete nature of this reinterpretation, you, most of your uh, axioms won't hold, right? Because Yes, but if you think of types, if you think so, if you think of repetitions, of course, this is just a parable. If you think of reflection, this is not a parable, right? If you think of of the Kaplan, Agranov, and company, that is not a parable. If you think of 
types of agents, again, this is not a parable. The only case in which it is really a parable is when you think of repetition. That's, then you're right. It's an interpolation exercise, if you want. Randomize a question. <laughs> that's that's, that's my question. <laughs> 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 Thank you.